slowness, heaviness, vagueness. These are the artistic and even existential qualities that, if I had to, I would choose over quickness, lightness, and exactitude. Fortunately, we don't have to choose. We can embrace the whole spectrum without prejudice. But by way of response to Calvino's memo about lightness, let me, for the rest of this hour, make a case in favor of heaviness. I'll begin by remarking that contrary to Calvino's claim that we live in an age that would petrify us with its Medusa head, our age, in fact, sponsors and exalts all that is light, quick, exact, visible, and multiple. Our reality is determined more and more by weightless bits and bytes of software and by the aerial vectors of information. The massive mainframe computers that Atlas himself couldn't carry on his shoulders a few decades ago have become so light and fast that nowadays we carry their equivalent around in our shirt pockets. Soon they will fit into Queen Mab's little hazelnut. So I don't agree with Calvino that our world is threatened by the petrifying weight of reality. I believe, if anything, that it's more threatened by the increasing irreality of the spirit of lightness. Above all, it is threatened by the irreality of the virtual and the indirectness of the screen. Perseus's shield has become the cell phone screen its magic has been transformed into imagistic wizardry, miniaturized gadgetry, and two-dimensional escapism. I'll leave aside here things like nanotechnology, genetics, and neuroscience, which are further miniaturizing and rarefying the real. The point is that, from a certain perspective, Calvino has written more of a tribute to the ascendant spirit of our time, rather than an admonition. So let me make my countercase by returning for a moment to Dante. Calvino's right about Dante being the poet of weight, in whom, I quote him, everything acquires consistency and stability and where the weight of things is precisely established. And that's why I would call Dante a thinking or pensive poet. But more about that later. Let's remember that in the Inferno, Dante descends to the center of the earth where all the weight of the world collects. Lo mezzo al quale ogni gravezza si rauna, he says in Inferno 32. He has to pass through this center or midpoint of all weight in order to get out of hell and onto the shores of the mountain of purgatory. Thus weight is in some essential sense, the essence of Inferno. And yet, and yet, Dante feels the pull of gravity even more forcefully in purgatory than he does in hell, since the pilgrim has to strain against it as he climbs up the mountain's seven terraces, where the seven deadly sins are purged. The pilgrim feels lighter and lighter as he goes from one terrace to the next, and by the time he reaches Eden at the summit of the mountain of purgatory, he has overcome that weight of sin that had dragged him down at the beginning of his journey. And once in Eden, he's ready now to follow his bliss in and around what Eden's ancient forest, as he calls it, offers him. This place where humankind was once perfectly innocent and happy. Now, Dante's Eden, amazingly enough, is not a garden, but a forest whose dense canopy of leaves keeps the place covered with perpetual shade. Here is how Dante describes it near the beginning of Purgatory 28. I'll read the first two tercets in Italian and then the English translation. Un'aura dolce senza mutamento avere in sé mi feria per la fronte non di più colpo che soave vento, per cui le fronde, tremolando pronte, 
tutte quante piegavano alla parte ove la prima ombra gita il santo monte. Here we go. A sweet breeze, unchanging in itself, struck my brow with no greater force than a gentle wind by which the pliant branches, trembling, were bent, all of them, toward where the holy mountain casts its earliest shadow, but not parted so much from their straightness that the little birds in the treetops left off their exerting their every art. But with gladness they welcomed the first hours, singing among the leaves, which kept the bass note to their rhymes, like the note that gathers from branch to branch in the pine forest on the shore of Classe, where Aeolus looses the Scirocco. What interests me here is that constant bass note. Dante calls it a bordone, which underlies the bird's high-pitched melodies and rhymes. Dante compares it to what one hears in the pine forest of Classe, which is near Ravenna, where he spent the last years of his life under the patronage of Guido da Polenta. Aeolus, of course, is the wind god, and the Scirocco is the southeast wind that Dante would have heard in this pine forest as it blew through the leaves creating this bass note, or bordone. The proper English term for it is a drone. It's typical of Dante, who is the poet of weight, that he would counterbalance the light, various, and cheerful sounds of birdsong with this bordone. Now, technically, the bordone is the deepest note of a bagpipe, or viela, which is the medieval ancestor of the viola, and it was a frequent feature in medieval music. This drone is the sound the forest of Eden makes as a steady, perpetual breeze moves through its leaves. Now that breeze is not a meteorological wind since Eden is located on the highest mountain on earth, in the southern hemisphere, beyond the reach of meteorological disturbances. The summit of the mountain is in that portion of the sphere of air that prolongs the motion imparted to it by the daily revolution of the heavens. In other words, it's the constant, orderly, and perfect rotation of the heavenly spheres that causes this wind. That's why Dante says it's unchanging. So this bordone, this steady bass note, that Dante hears in Eden, I imagine it as heavy, deep, full of gravity, yet perfectly serene, the sound of a primordial earth prior to the shrieks of human history. 